Hey, good day there. This is Joe Van Cleve, and today uh, I'm going to be talking about some retro video technology. And this technology dates back to the middle to the late 1990s, approximately a decade before YouTube. And it's the Tyco Video Cam. Stay tuned. So what this is, this is a video camera designed for kids, and it's designed to kind of emulate in appearance a camcorder. It doesn't actually record video. You had to plug it into a VCR. But its legacy comes from the 1980s and a product built by Fisher Price called a PXL 2000 Pixel Vision. The Fisher Price Pixel Vision, which I wish I had a, a copy of, I've actually used one and I've actually repaired one in the past. But the Fisher Price Pixel Vision was a rather complicated toy, rather sophisticated, that used um, a unique kind of a video a system to record black and white low resolution video onto audio cassette tape. And a 90 minute Type 2 audio cassette would hold about five minutes of video. Uh, so in the 1990s, Tyco marketed this video, Tyco video cam, which I think was also marketed as the Tyco Kids Cam. And what it is, it came in a little plastic or a little zippered pouch, and um, it kind of has the appearance of a camcorder, in, including the little rubber lens cap, and it has the hand grip on the side for your hand and a little power switch that slides on and off. And there's a red power light. There's a couple connectors on the bottom and the back. One's for your video output and one's for power if you want to power it by external power supply. Otherwise, you had to use six AA batteries. There is a real microphone up here, and it's actually a fairly good quality microphone considering it's a kid's camera. And the camera itself is actually a little board camera, a little bit bigger than the size of a postage stamp, and it's a black and white surveillance quality fixed focus um, surveillance camera. The uh, viewfinder is nothing more than a square tunnel with a, uh, a little piece of plastic in the front and back and a rubber eyepiece, but it basically is just a viewing port to allow you to view the approximate angle of view of the camera itself. So it has the appearance of a camcorder, but all it does is output video and audio signals, and you had to plug it into a, cam uh, to a VCR to record, and it came supplied with a long, and I can't remember how much, maybe 30 foot long cable. You had uh, this, let's see here, on one end of the cable, so it's a twin lead cable, and it has a kind of an eighth inch connector, uh, ground, audio, and video, so three conductors. And then the other side of the cable was a female jack, and then you had an adapter that went from that eighth inch style connector to uh, monaural audio and composite video. And you plug these two cables into your VCR, and you could record, and you had enough cable for, like I say, 20 or 30 feet. And it came with this little tripod, a little handheld tripod that had little hooks for winding up the cable on it that you pull out the legs, kind of like that. They kind of splay out into this little tripod system with a little adjustable uh, head on it, like that, and you could uh, mount the camcorder on it with the tripod mount, like that. And so the idea was for kids to, uh, you know, play with this and shoot their own little movies around the house or whatever. The thing is really primitive. It has a kind of a low quality black and white picture, but I'm going to take it out to the garage. I have a television monitor set up that has a composite video input, and I'm just going to shoot the screen of the TV monitor so we can kind of see the picture of it. I don't really have a capture card on my computer to capture analog video, but we're just going to look at the screen of the TV, look at this, and then we're going to, I'm going to take it apart and show you the insides of it, and then I have a little surprise after that, so stay tuned. Well, we're out here in my junky, dirty, cluttered workshop, and uh, I have this little TV set here that has a composite video input. I'm going to turn that on. Now, this uh, Tyco video camera runs normally on six AA batteries, and I'm actually out of batteries at the moment. So I'm going to power it from the external DC input jack, which calls for nine volts, uh, positive tip connection and I have I happen to have this old JVC uh, AC adapter 
that puts out 9 volts with positive tip in the right size connector. So we're going to plug that in and get this thing powered up and show you what it looks like. So I'm going to power, plug the power into the camera. We're going to plug the power into here. Then I'm going to get the, the adapter and the eighth inch connector goes into the connector on the bottom of the camera and then the composite video gets plugged into the back of my monitor TV and I'm just going to plug in the video because otherwise the audio is going to get feedback on the between the microphone and the speaker unless I mute it so uh, let's see here now earlier today when I was testing this, I was having an intermittent problem with this DC power connector, but it, there's the red light and there is the picture. So let me just set the camera up and I will zoom this into the video monitor and we will see about looking at it here. Let's see if I can adjust the exposure. Okay, so you probably can't recognize what that is, but let me try to... So there is my face. And of course, this is a 4x3 video signal. This is composite analog video. So I've set up my TV monitor to display a 4x3 normal aspect ratio picture. And um, so the angle of view on this camera, so I'm holding this camera about almost arm's length, and it has my head pretty well my face pretty well filling the screen so it's a fairly narrow angle of view it's not nearly as as wide of an angle of view as you might want but keep in mind that because it's a fixed focus lens and a fixed focal length lens um, they had to choose some kind of an angle of view that did a little bit of wide angle and a little bit of telephoto not knowing how kids are going to use the camera so they can it's more like in 35 millimeter film terms, it's probably at least a 50 millimeter in terms of angle of view, maybe a little bit longer than that. But so it's a very soft picture, um, and I've actually improved <laughs> the quality of the video a little bit. It was it was even softer because the lens wasn't focusing properly. And what I've done, and uh, I'll show you when I take this thing apart, what I've done to improve the focus on this camera, but it's a very low resolution intended for VHS at, at best uh, quality video. But it's an interesting picture. And uh, so let's go ahead and uh, start taking it apart and see what this thing is made of. All right, well, to take this apart, uh, so I have the connectors disconnected from the back of the camera. Uh, there's no batteries in it, so you basically want to take out these four screws right here. So we'll do that first. Okay, so the four screws are out, and now the top rear of the camera, I'm going to try to split this open a little bit, and this top panel, this top piece here has to pull forward a little bit. So let's see if I can do that. Like that. So that top piece pulls forward and now you can slip it back and take it off. And once you do that it reveals the fifth screw which is right here. Okay, so when you take a look down inside the camera, um, there is a circuit board right here with uh, some analog electronic components. And then there's some wires that go up to the front of the camera. And it's actually pretty darn simple. So I'm going to pop this thing apart. I'm going to lay it on its left side. And it comes apart like that. The left body shell comes off. And this little ring around the sensor lens is just a fake uh, focus ring. It actually holds the lens cap in place. The, le the little string for the lens cap uh, goes around this little standoff here. And here's the sensor. It fits into a little slot and molded into the uh, front of the camera. This is the microphone. It fits into a little slot right here. 
and the wiring harness for the uh, microphone and the video wrap around each other for noise reduction purposes so you don't get 60 hertz hum in your audio and then it goes to a little circuit board the analog circuit board up here that has your power switch your red LED and then there's a, a little band there's a little flexible board well it's connected by a flex cable that has your two connectors on it right here and then your battery pack is right here and it plugs into the board up here. Pretty simple. <laughs> so, I'm going to pull off the plastic module that has the sensor on it. And so it's molded plastic, it has a lens, probably plastic optics I'm guessing, and what I've noticed on this is it looks like there's helical threads on the side of this lens, but they've been glued down with some kind of adhesive. And I've tried to dissolve the adhesive with uh, alcohol, but I haven't been able to. And I didn't want to add so much alcohol to mess up the, the plastic lens. So I can't adjust the focus on this um, little lens manually. But what we're going to do, if you look around the back of the housing for the sensor, there's two little screws that hold the sensor housing together. Let's, do, let's take that apart, take those screws out, and see what we get. Okay, I've taken the two screws off, and this back housing for the sensor just pulls off. There is a slot here on top for the cables to come out of. So I'm going to set that over here. And then I'm going to carefully pull the sensor back the sensor circuit board back away from the front lens housing and in doing so you'll be able to see there is my sensor and it is a probably a CCD sensor maybe CMOS I don't know due to the age of it, it might be CCD uh, and it looks like it's covered in a thin piece of glass the whole sensor is right there so pretty easy to keep to clean just to use basic optical cleaning stuff don't get any get your fingerprints on it now, what I noticed was on the housing that mounts the that, that the sensor mounts to, um, it has these two standoffs for the screws, and then it has these two little posts that go through holes in the sensor. And there's a little flange built around here that the sensor circuit board sits against, and that kind of fixes the focus between that and the lens. And because I couldn't actually adjust the focus of the lens itself. What I noticed was, in order to improve the sharpness slightly, I noticed I had to pull the sensor slightly back from the flange. And what I've done in, to do that is I have two little pieces of uh, two mil thick, that's two thousandths of an inch thick brass. And I've taped them to opposite diagonal corners with some gaffer's tape. And that's acting as a little shim in order to shim the circuit board so I can get a little bit better focus. So let me hook up the cables and turn on the camera and I'll show you how you can adjust the focus by just modifying the distance between the lens and the sensor. Alright, so you're looking at the TV screen now and I'm just holding up this circuit board in my hands and the sensor is not even screwed into it. And now I'm going to very slightly, let me see if I can aim it up to the ceiling, maybe something not so glaring. Here, there's my face. So I'm going to pull the sensor backwards from the lens very slightly and you can see how it defocuses and so if I push it really far up against it it almost is not focused well and if you pull it back slightly it focuses better. Now you have to kind of optimize this lens for the focal length that you intend to be used at and I noticed that this sensor was optimized for infinity focus because when I opened up the garage door and focused it across the street on a distant scene it seemed to be better focused than arm's length but if you think about the usage mode of this camera it's wired to a VCR in a house so it really should be focused more close up than infinity focus more for room size distances right and close ups of people's faces so by putting those little brass shims in here I've actually improved the focus. Now ideally it would be nice to be able to turn this lens and adjust it as you can but again it's glued together and I was unable to get enough alcohol in there to break the glue and I didn't want to ruin the plastic lens with getting too much alcohol in it so that's what I had to do.
So this Tyco video camera is kind of an interesting little piece of technology. It's, it's really based around a simple surveillance board camera, a little black and white solid state board camera with a fixed lens. Uh, nothing super high tech. Uh, it was pretty standard for its day. Um, the way I use this camera, it was a curiosity when I first bought it back in the mid 90s. I think they originally, I originally saw them on sale for $99 at, at places like Toys R Us, but later on they came down to $49 or $50 here in the United States, at least where I saw it. But well, the way I use this, because I like the look of the black and white video, and I noticed that these little CCD cameras were very sensitive to, to infrared light. In fact, I don't really have an, an opportunity to, to shine it outdoors at a, uh, to aim it outdoors at, at foliage, but the green leaves of trees and plants glows really bright like infrared cameras do. There's a lot of infrared on this camera, and if you aim a uh, infrared light source like, for instance, the remote control to a TV set, it'll, it'll flash very brightly in front of the, the camera. So it's very infrared sensitive. So it had an interesting look to it for video, in spite of the fact that it was very soft, low resolution. It had a certain quality for kind of art video is what I would term it as. So the way I used this camera uh, out in the field was I had a Sony Hi8 analog camcorder that you could plug external composite video and audio inputs to it and I used it as a recording VCR and plugged the, the little yellow cable from here into the cam the Sony and then I would use this as the video source recording on the hi8 tape and then I would vi I would edit that tape later on and put some sound effects on it and I made a series of experimental videos with this that were kind of in the same style as some of the early video artists who used the Fisher-Price Pixel Vision, but I was using the Tyco Kids Cam instead. So um, I got interested in the idea that these little black and white surveillance cameras is really what the heart of this was, and I started looking around uh, later on on some electronic mail order catalogs, and I noticed at the time, and this is, I'm talking about in the time frame of the late 90s, early aughts, I noticed that you could buy black and white little surveillance cameras with a built-in lens and a good quality glass lens for under $100. I think it was maybe like $50. And so I built my own version of this. Let me show you it. So I went down to my local electronic supply house. I think it was Electronic Parts Company here in Albuquerque. And I bought me one of these plastic project boxes that has the rubber little feet. I mounted my own tripod socket nut in the bottom, as you'll see soon. Um, this is the lens uh, of the actual board camera, and it came with a little rubber, kind of an eye cup, and it also is a manual focused lens, and it's a glass lens, and it's a coated glass lens, coated optics. Uh, these four little dudes are infrared LEDs, so I put a light source on it so I could illuminate something at night. Then in the back here, I have a video output, composite video output connector, and then I have a eighth inch jack for a, for a DC charger. This thing is powered by a 12 volt gel cell battery, and a power switch for the LEDs, and then this is the power switch for the camera itself. Now this little homemade version of the Tyco video camera is been sitting around for 20 years or more and the batteries are dead. The bad the gel cell battery is dead. But let me open this thing up here and show you what's in it. Okay, so there's basically four uh, long machine screws that holds the uh, case together and you pull that top of the case off. <clears throat> so this was all designed and built by yours truly and the heart of the system was built around this let me unplug the lug connectors, spade connectors. This was a PowerSonic PS1212. This is a 12 volt, 1.2 amp hour gel cell battery. And I, I chose the largest 12 volt battery I could find that would fit in this box and still give room for the rest of the electronics. This is a piece of, a couple pieces of masonite with a hole drilled in it and a blind nut, a quarter twenty blind nut that was then epoxied into the bottom of the box and that's the quarter twenty tripod mount. 
Uh, on the back of the inside of the box is all the wiring for the connectors. So you have the on-off switch for the camera itself and you have the jack down here for the DC input and you have the video output up here. I tried to, to route all the ground uh, commons to the ground line of the video output connector to reduce noise so this is like a common ground point. And then up front here this, this, these two sets of wires uh, let me turn it around here so the black and red set of wires goes to a resistor, a set of resistors, and it feeds power to the four infrared LEDs if I want infrared lighting. And then the other two, or the other three, go to this little connector, this Japanese style connector that feeds power to the board camera itself. And the board camera, you might notice compared to the Tyco one, this has a ground shield. It's a shielded camera and there's quite a few surface mount devices on the back of the camera itself. It has a lot of surface mount devices behind the shield. It's a little more sophisticated of a camera than what was in the uh, Tyco. And I'll show you the results here in a few minutes, uh, signal-wise. Now, one of the things I noticed when I took this apart earlier today, of course, I had a piece of foam to keep the battery from uh, rattling around in the, in the box. But I also had a piece of paper in the camera and what do you think that is? That is the schematic diagram for this box and essentially what we have is the DC voltage is a charge voltage uh, going in the jack here. When you're running off battery power, the battery power goes through the connector of the charge input. There's your power switch. When you turn the power switch on, it feeds power to the infrared LED switch and it also feeds power directly to the camera. And then the infrared LED switch has its own switch. And I'm using four LEDs in, a, in series with a 75 ohm resistors that drops the voltage enough to get the right biasing for those resistors to come on. So and then everything has a common ground back to the negative of the battery on the negative side of the video output connector. And the white connector is the video output of the, the board camera. So pretty simple uh, uh, setup. And the one thing I don't have is I don't have the actual charger for the battery, but I've, this battery is dead. And so I'm going to have to power the camera from an external power supply. So I don't have a 12 volt DC adapter with the right style connector to go into the back of the, the camera's charging jack. So what I'm going to do is I'm simply going to use some alligator clip leads and I'm going to go from this style connector. I'm going to connect the negative to the negative side of the wire, and then the positive um, is going to go, which is the yellow clip lead, the positive goes to the red, but in order to get the positive into the connector, the DC adapter connector, I'm going to use a little uh, small jeweler's screwdriver <laughs> and just stick it into the center of that connector to power, to provide power to the circuit. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to hook up a video cable from the output of this box to my TV monitor. Okay, I just turned on the uh, power switch to this camera now, and you might be able to tell that it's quite a bit sharper than the other one. Now I'm actually running this a little bit, it's a little bit hotter than 12 volts. This uh, 12 volt AC adapter is actually not regulated, so it depends on how much current you're drawing. This doesn't draw enough current to really drop it down to 12 volts, so it's really running about 15 volts. And consequently, the video is quite hot. The highlights are, the, the peak uh, signal is probably well above one volt peak to peak, which is what composite video should be. But nevertheless, so the lens up here on the front of the camera, which you can see my finger pointing to it, I can turn that lens and I can focus. So I'm going to put my wedding band next to it and I'm going to turn this lens and you'll be able to, if I get it up there, I'll be able to focus it right in on my ring and my fingerprints, the texture of my skin and all that. So you can see I can focus quite close and then I can focus back into infinity and I get quite a bit better quality video. Now you'll notice that the lens, it's quite a bit better quality, but it's also a very wide angle. So you have a lot of fisheye distortion. You can see this pincushion distortion right here. Uh, 
And so, yeah, it's pretty wide angle. It's built for surveillance. But I happen to have these little plastic loops that I bought at Harbor Freight Tools. And there's a 3X, 5X, 7X, 10X, and actually there's a 2X. Where is it? Right over here. So if I put one of these little magnifying loops over, let's do it the other way, over the lens, I might be able to get a little bit better quality. I wonder if I can focus it back. Let's see here. It still has a tunnel vision effect, you can see, but it, it does give you kind of a tunnel vision, but it straightens out the line somewhat. So you can kind of play around with this and put external magnifying lenses or wide angle correction lenses. One of the other things I have on this little lens is I have this um, microscope objective and my little focusing pla rubber focusing hood is a little bit crooked there. Okay, I have this microscope objecti objective. It's a Brumberger 3 quarter inch f1.6 and I've actually unscrewed this lens off the board camera and put this microscope objective in place of it. And if you do that, you can actually get really highly detailed close-up uh, video uh, signals uh, with this. But uh, so, and as I said, you can use these little magnifying lenses like that. But I also have a CCTV lens. This is a Fujinon. A Fuji one f1.7 35 millimeter um, lens that's built for larger size video cameras and it's too large of a lens to really use practically speaking on this camera but it, it ends up being really telephoto like super telephoto because this sensor is so small but there you have it so this particular uh, camera uh, box camera I was using in the same way as the Tyco one. I have the video output connected to my Sony camcorder and I was using it as a kind of a black and white camera. I, th I thought the quality of video on this I really liked it better than uh, than the black and white coming out of the Sony camera. I really think this has this kind of really cool analog surveillance quality uh, image that, that uh, is kind of unique and I really like it and so um, I don't know if you can sense any of the LEDs. Let me turn on the there is the infrared LEDs on and off and I turn if I turn off my overhead lights let's see you can see the difference in illumination even in this fairly bright garage between there's infrared on you can see the side of my face is brighter there's infrared off so this uh, these infrared LEDs do work quite well for using it at night uh, in places that has inadequate illumination. So this is my homemade version of the Tyco video camera. I don't never come up with a name for it, but it's kind of a surveillance camera that you can use with, with a camcorder or a VCR to make artistic black and white videos. Well, these uh, kinds of old, outdated, analog low resolution video cameras are really kind of fascinating to me for several reasons. First of all, they're so low of resolution that they're really not considered acceptable by today's YouTube video standards. Considering state of the art in YouTube is now 4K video and I'm not even doing that yet. Um, but back in the days of VHS and analog NTSC television sets, this kind of video was almost acceptable. You could record it to VHS or Hi8 or one of those formats, play it back, and it was kind of okay. Um, it was a very inex inexpensive and accessible way for kids and young video artists and pioneers in video to kind of explore the aesthetics of low resolution surveillance quality video. And I got to enjoy working with this this kind of format. Uh, the other thing about working with these analog cameras, of course, uh, these NTSC cameras, is that the NTSC video system is essentially outdated. Uh, 
not every uh, digital television set even these days even has a composite uh, analog NTSC video input anymore. And to do uh, to input composite video into your computer, you really need an external capture device of some kind. So it kind of precludes using uh, an iPad kind of video editing like I do. Uh, I don't really know if there's an analog capture device for iOS. Anyways, so these formats are kind of doubly uh, obsolete. They're doubly obsolete. They're obsolete in terms of the resolution and obsolete hardware-wise. Yet, they still work. If you have a, a uh, analog uh, video recording system of some kind, you can still record and edit this kind of signal. And it kind of raises the question of obsolete formats and if there is a validity, a valid place these days for obsolete formats. You know, I keep thinking of the popularism, uh, popularity of vinyl records. Uh, there's a certain cachet, a certain quality about vinyl. People like, I enjoy vinyl. And I don't think it's a so-called hipster affectation. I really do think vinyl is an interesting medium. I'm not so sure about analog video. I think these cameras, especially this one here, that's high enough resolution to not be really bad, but the real problem with it is just how do you record it in, in any kind of quality, right? Anyways, these are just some rambling thoughts that I've had. You know, in the past 10 or 20 years ago, I wrote whole journal books full of uh, thoughts around video art uh, employing these black and white surveillance style cameras and there's kind of a what I call a surveillance camera aesthetic that I was kind of exploring back then. I hope this gives you guys some ideas for exploring antiquated and outdated video technology. Technology that predates the smartphone and especially technology that predates YouTube. Uh, it's kind of an, a fascinating little corner of the abandoned world of old tech. Well, until next time, this is Joe Van Cleve, and you have yourselves a great day.